Hello, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to, uh, uh, to to begin this conversation with uh, with Dr. Eric Lander. Um, Eric is the, uh, the science advisor to the president. He is also the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and he's a member of the cabinet and uh, uh, has a deep, deep and long interest in health information technology and really looking forward to our discussion. Thanks so much for joining, Eric. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you. Too. Well, um, we're going to learn from each other, I think. Um, so <laughs> looking forward to it. So let me just let me just start just to you know get us oriented here. You were a member of, of the PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2010, when it issued a really highly influential report. I remember that report you know, quite vividly. Um, and it was an influential report on health information technology and interoperability. Um, I just wondered, was that, was that you know, kind of your first direct engagement in the area of health information technology? And, and also, how would you kind of you know, characterize the key learnings and recommendations from that report? Well, um, yes, it was the first time I, I really tried to grapple with the subject. And, and the whole PCAS grappled with this subject. Uh, I think we recognized it was incredibly important because the government was making big investments in electronic health records, which were not broadly used then, um, we all recognized that there were a lot of potential problems. And so on, on that President's Council, there was a lot of debate about what we needed to ensure. And we wrote this report that came out in 2010. Um, and pretty much the vision was a simple thing. In order to guarantee that patients would get Oh, the, the best possible care because their care providers would have accurate, up-to-date information about their whole medical record, we had to deal with the whole interoperability situation. And you know, to do that, it, it meant, in effect, that medical records had to talk to each other in some complete way. And the further we got into this, and we must have spent nine months working on this, the, the, the more we realized uh, that, that the solution was to guarantee that any two medical records could put out their data in a form that could be read by any other medical record. And then as we thought about it, we realized this was going to be key to unleashing the creativity of the whole industry, not just protecting the the, the care for an individual patient, but guaranteeing that if information was not locked up in individual medical record systems, but in fact could be shared when it was ever appropriate to do it, it'd be possible for third party vendors to write apps to improve those things. It would be possible for a, a hospital to change its medical records vendor because you could suck all the data out and put it into a new, better medical records vendor's product because they're enabling competition. Um, it'd be possible to connect medical records to the public health system when it was appropriate to do that, something that's become incredibly important during a pandemic when, it, when you know, one would like to know whether somebody who's just tested positive for COVID-19 has or has not been vaccinated and with what vaccine and on what date. And we had this vision that this, this all would become a seamless ecosystem by essentially guaranteeing that every medical record system would be able to put out its data in a structured, readable form. And of course, it would mean for individual patients that if they went on vacation, if they moved to a new city, they would be guaranteed that they would get complete care um, in, in this new location because the whole record would be interoperable. So I gotta say, we were utterly disappointed by what happened. Um, we put out this report. I still think it's a, it's a great report and it's got the right vision, um, but it, it was not the case that, that at the time, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology leaned in heavily into guaranteeing this vision. So it was in fact a major frustration of PCAST over the next eight years of the Obama administration. And it was only in the very end that we began to see action, both from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology and from the Congress for 21st Century Cures. And so I haven't been involved for the last four or five years. So I'm here to talk to you because 
Um, I'm, I'm hoping that all of those dreams from 2010 are, are now within reach. So my question back to you, Mickey, is how are we doing? Are we going to get there? So the short answer is, you know, yes, I think we're doing quite Good. well. Um, and, and let me describe it to you and, and help to pull you out of the trough of despair. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, so we spent, you know, we worked long and hard as an industry and, you know, with ONC, CMS and the federal government of, the, you know, those eight years of, you know, just getting the foundation laid of electronic health records. And to your point, it didn't start, you know, with, you know, the taking the PCAST uh, sort of, uh, you know, findings and saying, let's make those the first things that we implement. And, you know, you know, we can always go back and say, was that the right set of priorities, but whatever. But here we are now. The foundation is laid. And, you know, let me describe, you know, kind of where we are. So I think, you know, building on the PCAST report, and then the and then the Jason report, which followed in 2013, um, the, you know, ONC started what we might think of as, you know, sort of a little bit of a pivot in terms of, you know, certification towards standards-based APIs, which I think are very much in the spirit, if not, you know, almost a letter of what, you know, what uh, a part of what the PCAST report was talking about. So we started in 2015 with certification requirements that had a functional requirement for a patient access API. So at least we started with that. We didn't make it a technical requirement then. Uh, I wasn't in ONC then, but I'll still say we, I wasn't, uh, but we didn't make it a technical requirement because we thought that the standards were too immature. And that's always one of the balances that we have to strike here is, you know, you want to be, you know, forward leaning, but it doesn't do the industry any good to start to require standards that really aren't ready for prime time. So that was why we started with a functional requirement that said you have to have an API that was available to patients starting in 2015 certification. It had to meet these functional requirements to be able to get this payload of data and it had to be an API and it had certain functional requirements. And then we said, and in the future, we will make upgrade that to essentially to a technical requirement. So that's, that's where we began. Around the same time, the private sector actually stepped up in pretty dramatic ways, seeing the writing on the wall. And I think this is maybe a lesson for us about the interplay between where government regulation can be a really good thing to help motivate the industry. That if you sort of point directionally, the industry sort of gets it and says, okay, we know this is happening. Let's start moving, uh, you know, in that direction so that it gets done in a way that, you know, we think is going to be something that we can adopt. So the industry, um, you know, sort of grabbed hold of it and, and really, um, you know, deserves a lot of credit for accelerating the development of FHIR, the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources API standard, which we now see is, you know, become widely adopted across the industry and in most major EHR systems, consumer applications like the Apple Health Record, platform systems like Google Cloud, AWS, you know, Microsoft Azure. So at least on that first step, the API thing, I think we're making, you know, really good progress. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of the first step. Let me, let me uh, now describe the next step, um, which is, as you pointed out, the 21st Century Cures Act. So we took another step forward then by saying that, you know what, with the 21st Century Cures Act, what it says, there are three types of actors, providers, certified technology vendors, health information networks and exchanges, that have an obligation to make clinical data available to patients uh, via APIs accessible without special effort was the language that was put in there. And I think, you know, going back to your point, I think you know, it was certainly clear that there was some frustration that, you know, that, uh, that the Congress sort of instantiated in the 21st Century Cures Act saying, this isn't moving fast enough. People aren't sharing in the way that they should be. Um, there's still data hoarding. There's still rent seeking behavior. We need to start to turn that around, right? So that's you know that's what that law put in place. ONC put in you know it, it took a long time for the implementation to happen, um, but now we've got the final rule in effect. Went into effect on April fifth. What does that require? And I'm going to just go down a couple of things, and I'm going to stop. Um, uh, uh, so what does that require? It builds on those functional requirements for an API, and it um, says that you actually now have to have a technical requirement because one of the challenges we have is. We've got different EHR vendors who are putting APIs out in the market, and some of them are fire APIs, even though they're not required to, which is how the industry, you know, sort of move forward, which is great, but you still have a lot of variation. So for the apps that you were talking about, you know, can we have a world where you have apps that are scalable and substitutable? Right now, it's still hard to scale because Cerner's, you know, fire version, maybe a little bit different than Epix, maybe a little bit different than eClinical Works, maybe a little bit different than all scripts, maybe a little bit different than, you know, any other uh, fire APIs that are out there. Because again, they didn't have a technical requirement to meet. Starting in December, end of December 20, by December, end of December 2022, they have to meet a technical requirement that ONC has put out there already. 
Um, by the end of December of 2022, they also have to have a bulk access API available. So not getting just one patient at a time, but say, I want to get a roster of patients, like perhaps for a payer use case or a population health use case, or perhaps a public health use case in the future. Um, and uh, two other things, um, by uh, the end of December, well, this is even you know something that's required now, we did also add requirements for competitive business practices, such as transparency, fees conditions, and openness and pro-competitive conditions. If anyone's been following you know, what's been going on in the market with respect to app stores generally, this is very much of that flavor to say, this needs to be a level playing field for the entities and the organizations and the technologies that are holding data. They need to make that data available according to not just the technical requirement, but fair business practices as well. And then the final thing is, and I think this gets, you know, to your point of all data, right? Because that was one of the things you said is we want all the information available <laughs> um, is by the end of December, uh, by the end of 2023, it adds on to all of that and says, you have to um, have the functional capability to make available all electronically available information, EHI, electronic health information, whether it's structured or unstructured, but it has to be available in an electronic, an electronic computable format. And you have to make available the export format and the schema. So those who are receiving that data will actually know how to make sense of it. Um, so all of those things are now in rule and they are required to be in place by those dates. So any vendor could actually, or any, you know, anyone could actually implement those today. Um, they could go and get certified to any of that stuff today. All I described to you were the end dates for those things. So hopefully that gives you a sense and makes you feel a little bit better about, you know, where we're headed here. <laughs> all right. So I mean, this does make me feel a little bit better about where we're headed because, because I think this vision was, was a clear vision back in 2009 when we started writing this report. And, and it's certainly what you're describing is, is in the spirit and the direction. So can I take those pieces and, and let's just talk about them and understand what they, they really mean. Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that ONC has become more forward leaning. I'm delighted the 21st century cures, uh, you know, pointed out these problems and, and provided the, the power to, to end information blocking in many ways. But, you know, we're geeks. Let's, let's think about, is it all going to really work? So let's, let's start with these technical requirements. There's now APIs with, with technical requirements as opposed to just functional requirements. Tell me what that means. What, what does it do for me to, as, if, that it's a technical requirement? Yep, yep, yeah. So what that means is that, uh, that, that the implementation of the FIRE API has to meet an implementation guide that is a published open industry implementation guide that ONC says you are required to implement that particular version of FIRE. Because as we know, all of these standards across all industries, they're always evolving, always changing, always have new versions, um, always have updates. And so what you need to be able to do is say, we're pointing to a very particular implementation of that specification that everyone has to meet. And so what that means then is if you're a novel app developer, you can now have the expectation, well, once those are in place, and again, it has to be done by the end of 2022, any vendor can do it now, today, if they want, if your customers demand it of the vendors. Customers, please demand it of your vendors <laughs> um, because, because they can do it right away. Um, but once that's available, as an app developer, you'll have a much better ability to scale and build a real business, a novel business around being able to get data. It because counts on what I'm gonna get out of this thing. Yes, so it, so it means that I know that if I build this spec, it is going to be, you know, it's not going to be perfect. None of this is plug and play like electrical cords, but you can have a very high expectation now that my spec is going to be substantially usable across different EHR platforms. And, um, and, and that, that, other, that other side will support the queries that I make, and I know what I'm going to get back. And how many of the, of the important bits of your electronic health information do we have really clear fire standards for now. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a growing floor. It's a rising floor as, you know, we kind of think about, about it. So what we've done is we have um, identified what we call the US CDI, the US Core Data for Interoperability, which I like to think of loosely as it's the minimum data set for the healthcare delivery system. <laughs> it basically says, you know, here is the set of data elements that we believe that any clinical um, source system in the country 
if they were queried or they were exporting data to any arbitrary other party, this should be the minimum data set that they should be transporting, right? They, could, they can add more, but this is the minimum data set. And what we do is we try to curate, you know, what's appropriately mature to add that? Because again, what we don't want to do is add things that aren't yet ready for prime time, add things that aren't really industry priorities, you know, because again, this is trying, trying to be the minimum data set that applies generally to 80% of what people do day to day. Right. And so that USCDI is what's required, a part of that technical requirement that I was talking about, it points directly to the USCDI and says, you are required through your API to make available this USCDI. And that's a rising floor. So every year ONC takes industry input. We do a bunch of, you know, sort of criteria that we run through and we we add more and more data elements to that. Let's, let's talk about the floor a second, Mickey. Yeah. So uh, we have a patient, let's say, who, who is being treated for breast cancer. Things I might ask that are or are not in, in this, floor, covered by this floor so far. Um, the diagnosis itself, all treatments that were received for it. The genetic sequencing of the tumor and, and all of the genetic data that were obtained and digital images of mammograms and, and pathology. How much of that is, is already covered? By the yeah. uh, yes, yes, no, no. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, so you got the first two, um, the genetic sequencing, definitely an area in fire in the standards community that they're working on, you know, sort of maturing standards around that. Um, not yet ready for prime time. And then with respect to the imaging, what is required is the interpretation, not the image itself. And that'll be you know something that we're working on and could be in the pipeline here to say, we need the ability to have the image available, whether it's a link to a PAC system or the image itself, You know, we can figure out those details, but the interpretation is certainly required. So mm -hmm. at least you would be able to get that and you'd be able to say an image, a radiologist did look at an images, image and here is what that radiologist concluded from looking at that image. What's the rate limiting step for having things like the genetic sequence or the image? Is there not enough interest, not enough money behind it? If, if you wanted to have in two years uh, those things supported by great standards, how would you know what, what would you do to do that? What, what do we collectively have to do as, as government, as industry, as, as care providers to make sure that that floor keeps rising? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic question. So, um, you know, a couple of things. One is, you know, it's, it's like the, the inherent complexity of the data domain that you're in um, and how rapidly evolving is it? So, you know, genetics is, you know, a great example, right? There's very rapidly evolving, but I think that we probably got enough, I'm not an expert, but you are an expert though, uh, so you can tell me um, that we probably have enough institutional and collective knowledge now that we can say there's a baseline oh, here yeah. that we can start to standardize. So there is already a lot of work going on, you know, in that area. And we have our sync for genes was a project that we worked on that was starting to say, how do we fire enable the ability to, you know, be able to share that information. But then what you need to do is you need to have first, you know, sort of the clinical mapping of it, get a group of clinicians together who are going to use this in practice to say, all right, what is the modeling that's required to make this clinically useful and clinically meaningful? How do we apply you know, vocabularies, ontologies, all of that to this to make it clinically meaningful? Then you have to have you know, sort of the, the, um, the standards mapping, the, informatation, the informaticians to come in and say, all right, how do I take that clinical modeling and turn it into things that are computable and represent, represented in computable fashion in the body of standards that we already have? So it's aligned and connected with um, you know, the structure and the hierarchy and the, um, and the coding that we already have. And then we need to get the implementers directly involved, which is to say, who are the people who are actually going to have to implement in this field? How to implement all this? How do we iron out the wrinkles that are always going to be there when you go from a group of really smart people who are working on a whiteboard and those who actually have to start coding and putting it into practice, right? There's always a gap between those two things. And so you want to say, how do you get the implementers involved as early as possible to iron out as many of those wrinkles as possible? And then you're able to say, all right, now it's ready for a consensus standards process um, like HL7 or you know any of the other standards development organizations to run it through its cycles. So that's you know, kind of the process. Sorry, last point is one of the things that we've done to try to say, how do we get the standards process to be a little bit more uh, you know, sort of nimble because with the pace, right? Because because we got the pace of industry, and you want to strike the balance between we want standards, but we also don't want to be beholden to processes that, that take too long. 
Um, and so what, what uh, you know, HL7 in particular has had a number of what we call fire accelerators. And these are basically groups of strong affinity kinds of organizations who have very particular use case in mind. And they get together to say, here is a use case that we want to accelerate. So we want to do all of the work that I was just describing, fast track it, so that when we make it available to the consensus process and the validating process, it is much more likely to go through in you know more speedy way because we've done all the hard work behind the scenes, you know, to get that to a place of maturity where it's ready for prime time. Um, is, there, is there a roadmap I could click on and see all this activity going on, what these fire accelerators are doing, and you know what what things are in the consensus process and what things are being thought about? Is is there a, a clear picture? Uh, clear is a relative term, but <laughs> but you can definitely go to the HL7 website and look at the fire accelerators. So the Argonaut project um, is there, which which focused on um, provider to provider use cases, and they, that was the first one that you know that kind of launched as a collaboration of EHR vendors, other technology companies, large provider organizations to accelerate that basic minimum data set that just said, how do I have you know, that basic data set available to a patient on their Apple health record, for example, or available in a, you know, in a CCDA or a fire, um, you know, a, a fire API was what they were focused on as I exchange information between Cerner and Epic or Cerner and Allscripts, whatever. So that was that one. But you've got DaVinci, which is focused on payer provider. You have Vulcan, which is focused on research use cases. Um, you've got the Gravity Project, which is focused on social determinants of health. So we've tried to sort of say, how do you have the market form organically around the problems that people really want to solve because i think you know you'll probably appreciate that just like with any endeavor you can do things conceptually but it's only when people have really like a problem to solve that they really dig in and say all right now i'm going to work on this because i really want to solve this problem yeah okay so so let's take social determinants of health because you know when we look at all the possible uses there some of them I could imagine have a lot of motive force behind them and funding from folks who want to see that get done. You know, what's going on with the social determinants of health group here? What are they focused on? And do they have all of the resources and oomph behind them? Because health equity is such an important part of this. And if we don't put it in by design, um, we're, evidence is pretty clear we're not going to have it. So pull the thread. I'm not going to let you go on, on this broader question of all the health information technology, but I, I'd love to dive into these social determinants of health and health equity for a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, well, I'm glad you, you mentioned that term de by design. That is one, one, one sort of concept we're working on from, from an ONC perspective, which is, you know, sort of this concept of saying, how do we think about health equity by design being a core construct of the way we think about IT? And, you know, and I think, you know, we've, there are lots of paradigms that, you know, or lots of similar paradigms in, in software development and systems, um, you know, systems and, uh, uh, and workflow development around, you know, security by design, privacy by design, safety by design. And we want to say, how does, how does health equity be a part of that as well? And so a couple of things that we're working on, for, you know, from ONC is, you know, first it's data. Um, data has got to be, you know, the core of this. And, you know, one of the challenges that we have is that we don't have enough reliable, accurate data related to an individual's um, uh, circumstances from, you know, social determinants of health perspective for anyone to even be able to act on. And a part of that challenge is that the data is highly unstructured right now and not, not yet standardized. And so a part of what the Gravity Project, for example, is working on, and, you know, what, I'm, I'm sure they can always use more resources, but, you know, they've got a lot of resources. They're making a ton of progress um, on saying, how do we break these out? Like, how would one characterize food insecurity? How would one characterize housing insecurity in structured ways so that then I can represent that consistently across EHR systems, for example? And then that leads me to the ability to say, now that I have that information, I can apply intelligence to it. Um, I can make it a part of, you know, sort of decision support. I can make it a part of automation of workflows for ordering or for, you know, making referrals, things like that, that we do more and more in the clinical side. But we want to be able to say, how do we bring social terms of health into that as well? So a part of it starts with the data. We're doing a bunch of work supporting the Gravity Project as well as other activities in the market um, to help them accelerate that work. Um, and we also, using that C US CDI mechanism that I talked about in July, we, um, we issued our final version of the version two, where we added social determinants of health um, categories in there, as well as um, SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity 
categories in there as start of a process where those become a part of that minimum data set that everyone is part of. Those will be part of the data set starting in July? No, not starting in July. So we have, so the USCDI process is very much, and we're going to get a little bit wonky here on, on the regulatory process. <laughs> but, wonky, so, yeah. well, I think, so don't stop now. Right. One of the things that, that ONC has done is, is tried to say, how do we have a process where we can get the market dynamism into, you know, sort of this process of, uh, of the regulatory cycle without having all of us beholden to the long, you know, sort of regulatory cycle process, because as we know, it's years, right? Regulations take years to, from conception to when they are actually finalized. And so what we do at the USCDI is we say, there is a process where we will issue our next version of the USCDI. That's essentially a set of guidelines. It's sub-regulatory. It tells the industry, these are things that are priorities for the country. And you need to start working on these in anticipation that most, maybe all, are going to become a part of regulation. Right? We can't prejudge what will be in regulation, obviously, but we can say, give strong indication that these are really important. And I know, having you know, been 20 years on the other side of the, of the fence uh, before I joined the federal government in January, we very much looked to the USCDI. When things were on the USCDI, we knew, okay, that's going to be a part of regulation. We should get started. So that begins that process. Then what we do is we sort of stair-step it. We say, all right, now it's a part of a guideline. The next step would be, how do we make them a part of what a vendor could voluntarily certify again? So again, we don't have to put that in regulation. We can just say that's a voluntary thing. If vendors want to do that, and that's where market demand can start to come in. If we say that, you know, wow, providers or Medicare or Medicaid or commercial payers say it's really important for us to have these social determinants of health data, they could say to their vendors, for example, you really need to get the voluntary certification in order to participate, you know, for your providers to participate in our program, for example. And that's where you can get a little bit of that, you know, sort of this client demand, you know, kind of coming together. And then the last step would be the regulatory process where it becomes certified, you know, something that's certified for all EHR system. So anyway, that's what we try to do. So the July is that first, you know, indication to the market, this is coming, start the hard work on it, and um, and then we're underway. Cool. Wow. I mean, you're just saying it right now. So that's, that's, it's great that it's, it's out there. And this happened in July. It happened in July. Um, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of great industry attention to it. We had a press release um, from HHS um, and, uh, and there's a lot of excitement around it. I think there's a lot of work going on in the market, which, uh, you know, I think, I think is a really great thing. And, you know, one of the things I think that, you know, that we can do in the health IT space from a federal government perspective is, we can, you know, sort of give tailwinds to things that are already happening, right? It isn't as if no one was thinking about this, but it gives tailwinds and it gives some focus because it's happening in all different directions, proprietary people going off in their own directions. And we're able to sort of say, you know what, directionally, this is great, but let's point it toward the common good here. <laughs> and how do we, how do we set up the guardrails for the common good? No, no, this is, this is a tremendous important thing government can do is, and so, but now let me, let me take you one year further in that timeline you were laying out to the end of 2023, because I want to press you even harder. Um, you talked about all electronic health information being available, and, and that was a big part of what we were thinking about, because I need all. I mean, somebody, somebody goes and you know, has some important health event happen to them while they're on vacation, you don't know what you might need in their health record. Yep. So all is a big deal. How's that gonna happen exactly? Because you're telling me these, these, these fire APIs, we got standards for some things, but not other things. So one year later, all electronic health information has to become available. How's that gonna happen? <laughs> Starting to buy now. No. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> We're just, in charge. I'm, I'm... <laughs> we, we just provide the direction. <laughs> no, I think that, you know, uh, 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 stepping back to be a little serious here, um, what we've done, I think, you know, philosophically, if we go back to um, going back to the PCAST report, I think you and I, you know, talked a little bit, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, a little while ago about there was the universal exchange language that was a part of that. And I think we, you know, as we were both talking about that, it was like, well, one of the challenges you have with saying you want everything standardized is that then that becomes the rate limiting step. Right. And you start to realize, oh, oh boy, you know, do you really want that to be the rate limiting step? We're going to be here forever. Yeah, you got to um, wait till you build the whole exchange. Plan. Yeah, yeah, right. You have to wait for it. And of course, we were just talking about genetic data, right? That's, that's also a never ending 
path, right? What's going to be the next thing beyond genetic data that we're going to want? There's always going to be new medical science is, you know, incredibly productive, and there are going to be new things that we're going to want to have in this pipeline. So one of the things that we, I think we did, you know, philosophically was to say, we cannot hold ourselves now to saying that what should be available for interoperability should be constrained by what's standardized. And so that's how we've, you know, tried to strike the balance by saying that there are things that should be standardized, which is the USCDI, and that's going to be this rising floor minimum data set available through the APIs. So fire APIs tied to that USCDI and, you know, CCDA earlier constructs as well, but that's what should be made available via that. But we're not going to limit ourselves to what should be available. We're going to say that everything between that and what we're calling electronic health information, EHI, which is essentially all of the information that's electronically available in a record. We can get into really mind-numbing conversations about what's the designated record set? What's EPHI versus EHI? These fascinating conversations that we, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time making sure that everyone understands what the definitions are. But the idea of EHI is basically it's everything that's electronically available in that system needs to be made available regardless of, and this was the, was the philosophical shift to say, even if it's not structured, even if it's, not, if it's unstructured, make it available in a computable format, which was another thing we said. So that, you know, what the regulation says is it has to be available. It has to be electronic health information. Um, it has to be in a computable format and you have to provide the, um, uh, the information for the format, the export format and the export schema so that those who are receiving it know what to do with it. They know what's actually in it. You're not required to release proprietary schemas or anything like that. It's just the export schema, whatever it is, and then allow the other parties to be able to you know, get it and grab it. It's not through a single API. It'll still be you know, multiple mechanisms to make that available. So you know, we'll have that to live with for a while, then maybe industry conventions. What we're hoping is that with the thrust of fire, that more and more people will see it to be in their interest to say, you know what, I'm just going to make this available via a Fire API, a loosely profiled Fire API that has the structured data as well as the, the unstructured data just available via a single API. So we can let the market develop around that. I, I got all this EHI, this electronic yep. health information sitting in a system, and you're requiring, and it's already required by rule now by the end of 2023 that all of that has to be made available somehow. But it might be 25 different ways that that information gets queried. Yep. Um, that could be a bit inconvenient. But you're saying the vendor will have to say, look, all the information could be found in, in A through Z place. And for those, here's how you get it. And I could presumably launch a query that would get it from all of those 25 places, some string query of all those things. In my have, go ahead, go ahead. Have a description of what I'm getting back there that um, if I'm an app developer, I could at least take a stab at using and integrating that information. And as a test of whether I've got all of it, how about the following? You know, when people use, you know, say Google Translate, you translate from you know English into some language, and then you translate back to English. They call it round tripping. So, is a reasonable standard that if I suck out all the EHI based on these various different paths the vendor has given me, and then that same EHI sucks back in those data, that it properly reconstitutes the record? Would that be a functional test that I had really achieved the goal? Yeah, and it's 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 like a it's like a little bit of an EHR Turing test or something. <laughs> Was it did, did it come from a file or did it come from a human actually documenting it? <laughs> For example, but at the very it's a pretty it's a lot easier than the Turing test. Right, all right. Then I ought to be able to put out the data and then take it back in yep, yep. and back the same record. And so yeah, I mean, you just compare it for patient X and patient X prime, the avatar that comes from sucking it back in. Now, should you guys require that as a, as a kind of test that this has been achieved? So we don't as a part of certification, but, you know, but we can consider something like that. I mean, we, yeah, so we don't require it, but I think it is a good, you know, sort of intuitive idea of what is it we're trying to accomplish here. That EHI export function is actually an outgrowth of what used to be an early requirement, earlier requirement that we call data export, which was explicitly for portability. The use case that we had there was, a provider wants to move from one EHR system to another, how can they essentially push a button and have the download of that information 
from their current EHR to the one they're moving to. And the EHI construct really grew out of that, you know, core construct. So I think, you know, philosophically and conceptually, it is very much in line with, you know, with the way we're thinking about that. It's just that as we look to 21st century cures and the way the market is said, we said, you know, this shouldn't be limited to that. It really should be EHI is available for patients. It's available for, you know, anyone who is an authorized user and ability to take that information. Oh, no, as we've known, the phone that, that can right. do any of that and put it forward to me in some, some fashion that's useful to me as a patient. Right. I certainly don't want to download this thing. I want some, some third party to give me something simple. So, right. you know, if that's the case, um, let me now ask you what might be a hard question. When, when this happens, when I get these uh, components of my EHI, do I patient have to pay for it? Does app developer have to pay for it? Basically, does anybody get charged for getting the EHI out of the system? No. So from a provider to patient, there is no charge. It's required to be made available without charge to the patient. Um, then, you know, provider to provider for other use cases, that's, you know, sort of a fee structure that, um, that, you know, is determined by those parties. But ONC has put in for, with respect to APIs anyway, and that doesn't apply to all EHI, but, you know, that's where you have HIPAA comes in. There are all sorts of other things that come in as well. Um, but from an API perspective, ONC has also put in regulations that basically ensure a competitive business climate. Let's say that there should be fair business practices with the way that pricing happens with the way that apps are, may, are um, uh, making available functions. So for example, it says that, you know, that you're allowed to charge, you should be able to allow that, you should be allowed to charge, but you're not allowed to exhibit rent-seeking behavior in the way that you're charging. Um, that you Does should- Does that mean that my, my price would be pretty close to my cost, you're saying? Yeah, with some reasonable profit in there, you know, and, and price regulation is always really hard. Um, yeah. So we put parameters in there to set the expectations. And then obviously if there were, um, it's very much a complaint driven process. So if a complaint was submitted to ONC that said that here is what I have experienced, you know, this vendor was charging this and I know that these vendors charge only this, I believe that, you know, that that is a, uh, a violation and then that would, that could kick off an OIG investigation and then there would be that, you know, sort of very detailed look at, you know, what's happening. Uh, right. Well, that might actually be an ONC, but, you know, again, it just depends on how that falls. But, uh, but the point is that fair business practices are part of another thing that we put in as a part of the fair business practices is that you as a vendor are not allowed to shut out an app because it might substitute for a function that you have within your EHR. Right, where you may see that as competitive. It's like, well, already I already have that, so I'm not going to allow that app. What the rules say is you have to allow the app. If a customer wants the app, you have to allow the app. Otherwise, how are we going to get improvement? If an right. employee could shut out a function, say yep. I have the function and some innovator has a better way of doing it, or even just a cleaner interface, we want them to be able to do it. Yep. Yep. So yeah. make sure that yeah. happens. So and I, I just want to be fair. It has to be fair also. I, I, I always hate that this always gets characterized as the big bad vendors who are trying to shut everyone up because, you know, my experience with, you know, working with the vendors is actually that they see this as the opportunity for them as well, because, you know, by and large, they know that, you know, there, there's so many more innovators out on the market. I mean, just think about how many, this generation of clinicians, how many of them come in technically sophisticated, either just because they're basic digital natives, even if they didn't major in computer science, but then you have a whole bunch who are PhDs as well as being MDs. They've got a whole bunch of programming experience under their belt and they're developing their own apps, right? And they, they have that demand. And if you're a large EHR vendor, you're thinking it's really hard for me to keep up with all the innovation that they want. If I can create a platform for them to innovate on and they stay on my product, that makes me better in the market, right? And yeah, yeah, I, I would say 10 years ago, maybe maybe it's fair to say people were not so enlightened, but more and more, I think, I think uh, you know, vend vendors are, are, are you know, like, like all of us recognizing that none of us can write all of the tools, that, all, that we really need to engage the whole world in writing those tools on, on platforms. But, but let me press you on moving off the platform. You know, yeah, of course, that, those kind of things will keep you on the platform, but maybe, you know, <clears throat> I'm not gonna name hospitals. Hospital A wants to move its electronic health records from vendor X to vendor Y. Um, I understand from these bulk data accesses that 
you know, you should be able to download or will soon uh, be required to, to, to be able to download not just a patient or a group of patients, but all patients. So I want to I want to just press a button and download the entire medical record of all the patients I've got in my hospital and upload it into some other system that cost me hospital half as much. Can my first vendor charge me to do that? Yes. So your first vendor can charge you, um, but and you know maybe I. I may, I may have lost track of exactly what the, you know, sort of the rule says about that, but I think that there is a reasonable charge that's allowed for that. But again, um, you know, again, you know, that there, there are some, you know, some, uh, uh, some restrictions on that. That's something I'm going to have to look into uh, further. Yeah, I'd be worth looking into because, of course, I have a lot of respect for EHR vendors. They're, they, you know, they work very hard, et cetera. But <clears throat> my guess is, like everything else in the economy, they'll become better if they face real market competition and something that provides a huge exit tax is going to limit competition. So we want to be sure that an exit tax isn't so large as to cause people to remain captive when they might want to move to another better product. My guess is what that'll really do is, is help encourage the first vendor to make their product better and better and better is because They'll want to keep keep customers on it, but of course, you know the secret of all of this is is we're trying to serve patients, and we want to do that by creating an ecosystem that continues to improve, keeps adding APIs, keeps adding ways to exchange things. We want to we want to of course make sure that it's economic for the parties that are in here, but that it's not as you say rent seek. Nobody is using quasi monopolies. To get to get more returns, and that that there are just fair returns for them. So it's those kind of things that you're you're optimistic we're going to be able to move toward that kind of an ecosystem. I am really optimistic. I mean, I I, I wouldn't have taken this job if I wasn't optimistic. Otherwise, it'd be yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. A, a really a tortured experience. Um, but no, I am I am really optimistic. And, and the reason I'm optimistic is that, you know, that we're starting to just see that, that things are evolving at the pace at which we see evolution outside of healthcare. Um, so, you know, for a while, healthcare was kind of a bubble when you think about, you know, sort of technology and general information technology in general, right? It was the real laggard in certain ways, hadn't really, you know, sort of uh, embraced the internet in terms of, you know, RESTful APIs and OAuth and, you know, all sorts of scalable ways of being able to have, you know, information sharing. And now that's starting to open up. And you know, and who knows what it's what what that will lead to? Will it lead to open source EHRs? Will it lead to my ability to not you know to have lower barriers to exit so I can jump from EHR to EHR? Or will it really really lead to an evolution? And this is where my money is, um, an evolution in the in the whole way that we conceive of what is an electronic health record. And then maybe yeah. that's much more of the way when well, you start to think about apps, you start to think about core infrastructure a basic documentation system that's got a whole bunch of native capabilities. And then you start to think about a constellation of apps and substitutable apps. And that boundary starts to become very fluid. I think I start to think about the way different EHR vendors think about that themselves, as well as the sophistication of these other kinds of tools and things, you know, and, uh, and it's kind of, you know, like cutting the cord with your cable. At some point, you, you know, do you start to say, well, you know, <laughs> do I, do I want to cut the cord and just say, you know what, I can live with, 15 awesome apps, because that is, you know, that's kind of where I live on a basic documentation system versus, no, I still want the full-blown enterprise system and having both of those as options available to people in the market. Well, that would be really radical. So you, you're imagining a world where different medical devices, the device maker might provide the electronic interface to the device that writes stuff out into any medical system rather than the EHR having to know about different devices, for example. That would well, be... Yeah, you know, I mean, all of this is, you know, there's, it's it's all uh, n-dimensional, right? All this network stuff, bits and bytes, <laughs> it can kind of grow and morph in, in any way that, uh, you know, in any way that the market seems to support in any way that, uh, and I think it's our job to, you know, create that, those guardrails as open and wide as possible that allow that kind of innovation, but set the direction right, to say, you know, do it this way directionally, and then that's going to, you know, sort of give us greater assurance that it'll be in the common good. 
Well, that is, that's a pretty exciting vision, that we can get to the point of an ecosystem where these, these interacting pieces can be factored in many different ways. Can I, can I then raise maybe, because I know we're, we're coming up soon to the end of our time, um, another device that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. It's, it's, um, it's the fax machine. Um, how long are we going to be using fax machines in, in clinical care, Mickey? Um, you know, just, I, I, okay, maybe somebody or somebody will have a machine, but, but could, you, could you foretell the death of the fax machine in medicine, please? I, you know, uh, I guess I, with, with confidence about, you know, five, seven years ago, I would have been very confident and say, yes, the end is coming. Now I'm not so confident since we're still <laughs> living in a world of fax machines. They have, incredible, fax machine they have an incredibly long tail. I, I don't know the answer to it. I think, you know, more and more it's, you know, you're seeing fewer and fewer, you know, manual fax machines, right? There's e-fax that, and I think that's one of the things that probably keeps it around longer than it should be, which is that if you're a provider in an EHR system from a workflow perspective, it may not really look any different, right? It would be, do I use a fire API? Do I send it as a CCDA? Or do I send it as a fax? To a, to a physician, it's just push a button. Um, yeah. It's obviously in terms of the format and the usability, it's a world of difference. It's a picture versus structured data. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I think it's going to be a long tail until we start to say, you know, there is a greater and greater market demand for having the structured data. And that's where I think value-based purchasing, all of those things come into play that say there is, you know, that, that you are going to suffer from sending things as faxes, even if it's the same workflow within your EHRs. And you're going to see that on the receiving end. You're going to see that on the sending end. And that's a, that's a little bit of why, you know, all the things that we started to do with respect to EHI we always had computable format, right? That was something that we would just insisted on. And we got into a little, you know, a whole bunch of philosophical discussion about, well, what's computable, what's machine readable, all that. And it was like, all right, well, maybe there's a little tiny bit of gray here around as a PDF, you know, computable. Well, it depends on the kind of PDF. Some are, some aren't. Uh, but, you know, but you start to say, but there is a line there. And faxes are clearly on one end of the line. <laughs> And computable is definitely on the other end of the line. So I'm hoping that that will be, you know, a lot of the momentum as well. So what's this all going to mean for patients going forward? Um, and for, you know, just the typical American, how's this going to change their, their interactions with the healthcare system? You know, we've been talking like geeks throughout this conversation, but I thought maybe we could just end by asking you to paint the picture of how this will make a, a tangible impact on real Americans. Yeah. Um, you know, to me, I, first and foremost, it gives them access and opportunity. And the reason I frame it that way is, you know, we don't know the answer to the question of how much do patients want to be directly engaged in this? How much do they actually want to have control of their data and bring in a whole bunch of, you know, really cool apps that are going to help them with wellness, not just acute healthcare or healthcare, the more broad definition of what's wellness and how do I think about that? And we know that there are, you know, there are the measured self individuals who are already doing this, right? They've got 10 monitors on them and they want to do that and that's great. Um, and, you know, and then there's some who really don't want to do that. And then you've got the huge middle part of that distribution. And we just don't know the answer to, you know, how much do they want to do that? How much do they want to be able to, you know, have healthcare be something that's shoppable in the same way that I go shop for a car or for other things. We have a lot of, you know, sort of uh, thoughts that we could probably have more of that in healthcare than we do today, but you know, how far down that path does that go? If people want to shop for, and I bet most people don't really want to get a, a ton of different apps. I mean, of course there are always early adopters and yep, yep, yep. all that, but you know, even if this is all invisible, all these geeky details are invisible, how will it just change their care? Even yep. if they never download an app and, and never want to, you know, actively engage in shopping, will this increase the quality of care for, you know, a, a working family in this country? Yeah, so I think it gives them, you know, the opportunity to have the access to do things directly. But I think, you know, behind the scenes, what it opens up is a whole new way of thinking about interoperability. 
And that, you know, even if it's happening in the, in the background, it offers greater usability for their providers to be able to get more information and in more usable ways to be able to deliver better care and the opportunity to take advantage of other, you know, kinds of companies and organizations that have expertise in things like algorithms and data, you know, and, and deep data mining and um, a really complex decision support and expert systems that may not be resident in EHR, but the opportunity to be able to say, you know what, we have the computing horsepower. We've now developed the technical and business models to allow that to become a part of the way we think about healthcare, you know, going forward. And there's obviously a lot of wrinkles that we that can need wire, you know, uh, ironed out. There's algorithmic bias along a whole bunch of dimensions, not just, you know, racial ethnicity, but other types of, of bias um, that, you know, that we need to figure out and, and develop models for that. But I think that op it just opens up avenues that haven't really been, you know, available to clinicians, um, you know, at the, at the top of the food chain or at the bottom of the food chain. So, so, you know, a real consumer experience that's better for them, integrated healthcare that knows them better. These are the kind of things that ultimately or why you're doing all these geeky things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, that is why we're doing these geeky things. <laughs> and, yeah. it's, and it's providing that direction and the motivation to the market, and the market needs to step up. So it's very much a public and private thing. Well, I know I know we've run out of time, but I, I do want to thank you, and, and, and I, I appreciate your firm commitment that you're going to solve all these problems in the next couple of years. Is that what I said? <laughs> I think I recall that. We'll check back on, on, on the tape here, but I think you promised to solve all these problems so that the vision of the PCAST report will finally be fully realized for the benefit of all Americans. And I just want to thank you for that commitment and everybody watching is, is here to hold you to it. So. Right. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm really grateful for the time, Eric, and, and thank you so much for, uh, you know, for, our, for participating today and for all the stuff that I you know, hope that OSTP and ONC can do in the future. We're looking forward to doing it with you. Thanks, Vicky. Right. Thanks, Eric.